Good morning. Welcome to our morning moment with Jesus on Thursday, the 30th of July. It's good to be with you this morning. It's a wonderful day here in Hereford, and I hope it is where you are. Lord has blessed us with another new day and a good night's rest, and we're grateful for that. It's good to be with you. Let's begin with a prayer, and then we'll get right into our lesson. Father, we're grateful for the new day that's upon us, for the blessings of the past night's rest, and the blessings that we anticipate, uh, have already received and anticipate through this day. It's just so good uh, that you have um, uh, continued to, to bless us in this way. Be with us as we look at uh, our text this morning. May we learn from it. Be with those who are dealing with uh, illness, whether it be COVID-19 related or whatever it may be, those who are grieving. Uh, we also want to remember particularly this morning, uh, our brother Dean Wiseman uh, here in, in uh, Hereford and the passing of his sister uh, early this morning. And we uh, pray that you'd be with the Dean and the rest of the family. Father, just uh, help us always to seek to know more of you and do more of your will. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going to get started with reading a passage, first of all, from Luke chapter 13. If you have your Bibles and would like to be turning there, uh, Luke 13, we're going to read verses 10 through 13 uh, to get us started in this event that's taking place in, in the life of Jesus. Beginning in verse 10, Luke records, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. Well, it wasn't in the verses we read, but here we go again. We have yet another Sabbath controversy that we're looking at this morning. I don't know if you've been keeping count or not, but I, I did. This is number five, Sabbath controversy. Jesus is in the synagogue teaching and he sees this woman with a physical need, and he moves to meet her need. However, as we've seen before, healing was not allowed on the Sabbath according to oral tradition. Let's take a look at this. While he is preaching, Jesus sees this, this woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. And he sees her in the audience. Dr. Luke says that she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. Now, Jesus indicates in verse 16, we'll read in just a moment, that she's been bound by a spirit by, by Satan. This may mean that she suffered from demon possession, but the description uh, of the ailment and the mode of Jesus healing it better fit a physical disorder. You'll recall that in Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, he speaks about his thorn in the flesh. And that was a physical ailment of some sort, but he called it there a messenger of Satan. Now we know that Paul was not demon possessed, so sometimes this can be used in that re reference. Well, let's read some more verses here, verses 14 to 16, and see more of what takes place here. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, 
as she is whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? Now the synagogue ruler apparently doesn't have the, the, the guts to speak to Jesus directly. Instead, he admonishes the crowd. It's as if he's blaming the woman for coming and being healed. He's way out of line. First of all, this woman did not come to be healed. Jesus notices her in the crowd and calls her out of the crowd to come to him and heals her. If anybody's to be blamed, it's Jesus, not this poor woman. Second, he turns an occasion of celebration into a fight when they ought to be celebrating. And third, He's more concerned about the nitpicky rules of, of the Pharisees than the health and freedom of one of God's precious children. He's angry because the rules of the Sabbath have been violated. Now, the rules of the Sabbath were based on Exodus 20, verses 9 and 10, where God in the Ten Commandments said, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And that is that they were to do no work. But the traditions of the Pharisees had come to the point, and they clearly stated that no action could be taken to heal on the Sabbath beyond what was necessary to save someone's life. So, for example, if a person fell down a flight of stairs on the Sabbath, you could stop the bleeding but you could not set the broken bones until after the sun had gone down at the end of the Sabbath. Christ, in another Sabbath controversy, had earlier used an example of pulling an animal out of a pit on the Sabbath. That was allowed. Matthew 12, verses 11 and 12. This time his illustration is similar in the last part of verse 15 and into verse 16. If the Pharisees could work in order to preserve an animal, that is to untie it from the stall and lead it to water, certainly Jesus could work to renew a daughter of Abraham, that is a Jewess. Of course, in a sense, Jesus is comparing apples to oranges. The Pharisees were doing only that which was necessary to preserve the life of their animals. And what Jesus does for this woman is non-essential. That is, it could have waited until the sun went down or until the next day. So, according to Pharisaic logic, Jesus is still guilty. But the whole point is that Jesus refuses to be subject to human logic and man-made traditions. He certainly would not forfeit an immediate opportunity to help someone in order to avoid offending a misguided, hypocritical system. Verse 17 here in Luke 13 tells us about the reaction. As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated. And the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. <laughs> this is such a sound victory for Jesus that his opponents are immediately humiliated. And I, you know, picture with me in your mind this scene and see these, these Jewish uh, leaders, these Pharisees and these scribes, the lawyers. They, It's almost as if they tuck tail and and run. They just scamper off. We're not told clearly, but surely from their history and what's going to happen later, surely they redouble their efforts to eliminate what they perceive as this troublemaker. I mean, after all, that is what they did last time Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath. Again, Matthew 12, verse 14, Mark 3, verse 6, and Luke 6, verse 11. The, cr the crowd, on the other hand, 
loves it. They love these glorious things that are happening, and their rejoicing is a positive indication of the future reception of Jesus when he enters Jerusalem for the Passover. Now, verses 18 to 21 here in Luke 13 uh, contains a couple of parables. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now, Jesus repeats here two parables that anticipate and illustrate the eventual growth of the kingdom. It had humble beginnings, even going all the way back, if you will, to the manger where Jesus was placed when he was born. But today, there is no greater institution, no greater power, no greater army than that of the kingdom of God. Now after Luke records these parables, he writes in verse 22, and he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Now what Luke may be recording here is simply the fact that wherever the Lord travels now, his final destination is on his mind. Now, on the other hand, it could indicate that Jesus makes a trip to Jerusalem about this time. John does, in his account, tell us about a visit to Jerusalem at the close of the latter Judean ministry. That's found in John chapter 10, verses 22 to 39. Let's take a look at that visit that John records in chapter 10. John chapter 10, I want to read to begin with verses 22 to 24. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us, plainly. That's been about two months since Jesus was last in Jerusalem, and he was there on that occasion, you'll recall, for the Feast of Tabernacles, and we spent several days talking about a lot of the teachings that he did there that John recorded for us. Jesus now is back in Jerusalem, and this time it is for the Feast of Dedication. Now, this feast was the last of the popular Jewish feast uh, to be instituted. It originated between the, the Testaments, between the, the close of the Old Testament and, and the birth of Jesus, and the birth of John, rather, at the beginning of the New Testament. It originated in this intertestament period in a time that was known as the period of Maccabean freedom. And what, it's, what it celebrates is a rededication of the temple that occurred about 165 B.C. Now, the temple that pre prior to that had been uh, defiled by a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes in that he had, had slaughtered a pig on the altar. And that defiled the altar and all of the temple, as far as the Jews were concerned, because pigs are unclean animals. Now, today, you and I know this feast better by the Hebrew word for dedication, and that is Hanukkah. The festival comes in December. In Jesus' day, it was a celebration that lasted for eight days, and although it was not one of the official pilgrim feasts, it was usually attended by a rather large 
number of pilgrims, a rather large crowd. The most notable feature of the feast was uh, the special lighting of the temple and many of the private homes in Jerusalem. And that's why sometimes it's called the Feast of Lights. So John says Jesus is there for the Feast of Dedication and he is in the temple area. He's walking around the portico, that is the porch of Solomon. Now this porch of Solomon is a covered area along the eastern wall of what's known as the Court of the Gentiles in the, te uh, the temple in Jerusalem. It would be a logical shelter from the cold winter wind or rain, as well as the largest place to gather a crowd. Later in the book of Acts, chapter 3 and verse 11, Peter will preach his second gospel sermon here at the portico portico of Solomon. Eventually, it will become a meeting place for the early Christians in Jerusalem. See Acts 5 verse 12. According to Jewish tradition, the wall along Solomon's porch was a remnant of the earlier temple that Solomon had built, the original temple built on the temple site in Jerusalem. So Jesus is walking and, and teaching, I would think, along this portico of Solomon. And the Jewish leaders come up and they, they crowd around Jesus and they challenge him. How long are you going to keep us in suspense, they say. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Their question appears to be reasonable enough. But it is a trap, or it is designed, rather, to trap Jesus. They want him to confess clearly if he thinks he is the Messiah. That way they can accuse him openly of blasphemy. Now the Lord has publicly indicated that he is the Messiah by using synonymous terms. For example, one phrase that he uses quite often is to refer to himself as the Son of Man. Now that was a, a, a term referring to the Messiah that was used by the Old Testament prophet Daniel as he prophesied about the Messiah's coming. It would cause no problem for any Jew of the day, or in particularly the Jewish leaders, to understand that he is claiming to be Christ, the Christ, the Messiah. He's claiming to be divine, that he's claiming to be God's son. And that's the reason they desire to kill him. But nevertheless, they want him to say it plainly and publicly that he is the Christ, the Messiah, so they can make a better case for putting him to death. Now, privately, Jesus has accepted the designation of Christ. Matthew 16, verses 16, 17, and 20. You remember there, Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say I am? And listen to their replies. And then he asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus has accepted that designation, but that was in private. He has not, however, publicly said, I am the Christ. After all, anyone could make that claim. He preferred to show that he is the Messiah, the Christ, by what he teaches and by what he does. John 10 here, verses 25, 37, and 38, that we're about to read. Also, his indirect approach avoids the conflict with his enemies that will eventually result in his death. That is, it postpones it until the right time. Well, let's read a few verses here, and then we're going to have to close right in the middle of this, but we'll pick it back up tomorrow. John 10, verses 25 through 30. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these 
testify of me. But you do not believe me because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, or I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, in speaking of his sheep, Jesus is picking up the illustration of the Good Shepherd that he used and, and John recorded in the first 18 verses here of chapter 10. And here he speaks about his care and his father's care for his sheep. That is, those who believe in him and follow him. Now, just a note here, verses 28 and 29 that we just read are sometimes used to prove the impossibility of falling away, of the impossibility of falling from grace. However, notice what Jesus is saying here. The emphasis here is, in Jesus' words, is on God's care for his sheep. Now that doesn't eliminate mankind's free will. Sheep have been known to jump over fences, and God's sheep can certainly jump out of his hand of safety. This passage does not teach that a child of God cannot fall, but it does teach that as long as we choose to stay in the shelter of God's protection, no one else has the power to snatch us away. Now again, as I said, we need to stop here for today. But tomorrow we're going to continue looking at this incident in, in the temple as the Jewish leaders, for not the first time, try to stone Jesus. Now real quickly, before we stop and have our prayer to end this morning, I want to just mention and uh, say happy anniversary to Linda. Linda and I have been married 49 years as of today. That's, it's been a great 49 years, and I'm looking forward to many more that the Lord is going to bless us with. So, happy anniversary, Linda, and, and uh, just, just great to be married to you and, and to share our lives together. Let's pause now as we close with a word of prayer. Loving Father, we're so grateful for your blessings in our lives and for the day that you've blessed us with. And Father, just help us as we see the teachings here of Jesus as, as he continues to tell people about his identity and about his uh, kingdom, about his mission, about what he came to do. And uh, we just, we're grateful, Father, that we can read and study it and know that he not only came to do something, but that he did it, that he gave his life for us, that we might have eternal life. I thank you, Father, for your word that tells us about that. Thank you, Father, for Linda and the 49 years that we've had together. And uh, we just pray your continued blessings upon us as we go forward. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I hope your Thursday is great. Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow at 10 o'clock to close out our weekly devotions for, the, for this week. Have a good Thursday.